Welcome to the programme. I'm in Belfast today and I've uh, been given the opportunity to use the RTE offices. This is the boardroom which we've changed rather into a, a studio. With me today is the Right Honourable Geoffrey Donaldson. Good to have you. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you very much, Gordon. Good Thank to be you. here. My notes tell me, Geoffrey, that uh, you're a Member of Parliament for, is it Lagan Valley, is that the right way to pronounce it? Um, that uh, you belong to the Democrat Unis Party, you're married to Eleanor and you've got two daughters. I'm sure there's lots more than that you could tell me. Do you want to just, just help our viewers to know a little bit about you? Uh, indeed, I'm uh, obviously a native of Northern Ireland. The constituency that I have represented now for over 16 years in the House of Commons is just to the west of Belfast. So from where we're sitting, um, just a few miles, and you're into the, uh, the beautiful surroundings of the Lagan Valley. The River Lagan is the river that flows into Belfast and into Belfast Lock. So um, I've got the, the nice parts of the upper reaches of the River Lagan. Um, it's a lovely constituency to represent, um, partly urban, partly rural. Um, my predecessor um, was um, uh, Lord Molyneux, who is um, still with us today, but uh, not as active in politics, obviously, in his um, uh, retirement years. Um, but he was the leader of the Unionist Party, um, and I was very fortunate to be able to follow him. Um, I've been actively involved in politics now for over 30 years in Northern Ireland, um, including, of course, um, a very um, active role in the peace process um, in the negotiating, negotiations leading up to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 and indeed since then and as well as being an MP for a period I was also a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly and served as a minister in the Northern Ireland government. Okay, I'm going to give away your, your age now because you've told us you've been an MP for 16 years mm -hmm. and I was going to say you were the youngest ever, is that right? At 22 you were voted in as, a, as an MP, is that right? Well you wouldn't be giving away my <laughs> age, um, Gordon, because that was to the Northern Ireland Assembly. I was ah, the youngest right. member at Stormont, so I'm a bit older than <laughs> you, you give me credit for. Um, yeah, I was the youngest member to be elected to Stormont, to the old Northern Ireland Assembly, before okay. the current so what, Assembly. what attracted you to politics? Why did you want to, to enter into politics, Geoffrey? Well, my interest in politics really began through, as often is the case in Northern Ireland, tragic circumstances. Um, when I was still at primary school back in uh, 1970, August 1970, uh, my cousin Samuel, who was a member of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, a police officer serving in South uh, Armagh in the southern part of Northern Ireland. Tragically, he was killed by an IRA bomb along with his colleague, Constable Roy Miller, and Samuel was the first RUC officer to be murdered by the provisional IRA in what has become known as the Troubles. Um, and that, uh, his death, had a very profound impact on my family circle, on the local community that I lived in. So uh, from then I took an interest in the politics of Northern Ireland. I wanted to understand why this had happened, what was going on, and right through my childhood I maintained an interest. I did many other things. I wasn't a, a political anorak as such. I um, enjoyed a, a very happy childhood uh, in the Kingdom of Mourne, which is in the southern part of County Down in Northern Ireland. Um, living under the shadow of the Mourne Mountains. Um, but it was also a childhood touched by tragedy, touched by the Troubles. My father uh, served in the Ulster Defence Regiment. He was a part-time soldier out protecting the community at night and uh, trying to earn a living for our family during the day. So um, the politics of Northern Ireland were very prominent uh, in my community and in my uh, early days. Okay, and where does faith fit into your, to your life, Geoffrey? Well, I'd been involved in the political process for a number of years, as you've indicated, elected at the age of 22 to the Northern Ireland Assembly. And when I look back on those early days, I suppose in a way I kind of felt that I was in control of my own life. And if I had had a motto in those days, it might have been, I'll do it my way. But um, over time, uh, um, God began to speak to me. I'd, I'd had a very strong Christian influence in my childhood. Um, my parents faithfully sent us uh, out to church and Sunday school. I'm the oldest of eight children, so we are a big family connection. And uh, you know, we would go to church every week um, and um, to the youth organizations, the Boys Brigade um, and my sisters to the Girls Brigade. So 
there was a very strong church influence in my early days. And, you know, um, when we read um, of Jesus' ministry, um, he um, shared the parable of um, sowing seed and how this is likened to spreading the Christian gospel. And in my childhood, the seeds of the gospel were firmly planted by Sunday school teachers, BB leaders, ministers of our church. I think of one occasion um, related to the incident I referred to earlier, the death of my cousin, when my Sunday school teacher, a young lady called June, was sharing one Sunday morning in Sunday school um, from God's Word. And my friend and I were more interested in the football results from the previous day than we were uh, in um, uh, what she had to say. And she stopped what she was reading and she looked across at us and she said, you know, I was once like you. Um, uh, and she recounted um, an evening at the Youth Fellowship in our church when June and her friends were there. And the young uh, youth leader uh, was a young man called Samuel, Samuel Donaldson, who um, was the young RUC officer um, killed in the Troubles. But Samuel, as well as being a policeman, was also um, a Christian and was the youth fellowship leader in our church. And Samuel was sharing from the Bible and he um, uh, was talking about God's Word and June and her friends, just like me and my friend, were not paying much attention. And Samuel stopped what he was reading and he looked at June and her friends and he said, you know, Jesus Christ died for you and I would gladly give up my life if just one of you would come to know Jesus as your Saviour. Now that's quite a profound statement for any human being to make. I'm not sure I could look at another human being in the eye and say I would give up my life if you would come to know Jesus as your Saviour. But just a few weeks after Samuel made that statement, he was killed by the IRA on, on, uh, while well, he was on duty on patrol in South Armagh. And as a result of his death and his witness, his Christian witness, June and many of her friends in the Youth Fellowship um, gave their lives to Christ. Um, Samuel's witness had um, uh, influenced them so much. Those words that he had shared with them that evening had such an impact um, that they became Christians. And there we were, um, several years later, June was sharing Samuel's witness. And here I am today, um, over 40 years after his death, still sharing Samuel's witness, his Christian faith. So those kind of influences were important in my childhood. Um, and uh, I remember attending a funeral. I had served, like my father, uh, in the Ulster Defence Regiment. And one of my comrades um, had been murdered by um, terrorists in our hometown. And I was at his funeral and we were singing the hymn, Abide With Me. And as we sang the words of the hymn and the verse, where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. God really spoke to me through the words of that verse of that hymn. And he challenged me about my own faith or lack of it. Um, and um, anyway, to cut a long story short, um, several months after that, um, uh, and at this stage I was married to my wife Eleanor um, and uh, um, a friend of ours came to our home one evening and talked about his Christian faith and in our own home together my wife and I both committed our lives to Christ and you might ask uh, how did that happen mm -hmm. and it was very simple I think it was less than one minute we prayed a little prayer together we asked Jesus to come into our hearts and into our lives to change us, transform us into the people that God wanted us to be, to forgive us for our sins and to heal us, to restore us. Um, and for me that was truly a life-changing experience. And from that moment it was no longer my motto, I'll do it my way. Um, um, my motto I think today would come from the book of Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and that has been my experience ever since. That's great, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean there are those who say, and maybe even some Christians who say, that to, to mix politics and religion is, is a dangerous thing to do and as you look around the world you can see so many places where it causes problems. How do you answer somebody who says that? Well, you, you can mix religion with a lot of things and it can be a dangerous thing to do. Um, of course I understand why people feel that way and indeed when I became a Christian, um, one of the first things I, I did was to put my political career up on the altar as it were before God and to ask 
God, if uh, he really wanted me to continue being in politics, if politics was the right place for a Christian to be. And um, through the Bible, um, God spoke to me and gave me examples of how he had been able to use people, his people, who he'd placed in positions of political responsibility because he had a wider plan and a purpose. Uh, if you look at the story of Joseph, if it's wrong for Christians to be involved in politics, why did God put Joseph into a political position? Um, he did it not so Joseph would become a great and powerful man, but because God had a plan for Israel. And in order to fulfill that plan, he needed to have Joseph in a place where he could make decisions that would save Israel. Um, why would that be different in the 21st century? Why would God not call some Christians into positions of political responsibility? No, not so that they and themselves could become great and powerful men or women, but because God has a plan. God has a purpose. He's a plan for Northern Ireland. And I believe that he has called men and women who are Christians into politics to help him fulfill his plan and his purpose here. So I don't accept the argument that God calls us out of politics and not to be part of it. Indeed, the Bible says that we are to pray for those in government over us. Why? So that we might live quiet and peaceable lives. Um, and um, I can't believe that God um, uh, wants politics to be the preserve of the non-believer. How do we change things? How can we be salt and light if the salt remains in its cellar and the light isn't set on a hill? Um, and so what I try to do, and I am clear, my first calling is to serve God as a Christian, but also to serve the people that I represent and to bring a Christian um, influence through my work as a politician, um, but to do so in practical ways. And you know, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, um, Jesus wasn't just a preacher, he was many other things. And um, when his disciples asked him, how will we know who your followers are, your believers? He said, by their fruits you will know them. And I'm not a great believer as a politician in preaching at people, more showing that through what I do and how I seek to reach out to others, how I seek to help the people who come to me for assistance, that there's something different um, and that that is influenced by my Christian faith. Okay. You, you, you're involved in lots of different organisations. Let me just pick up one or two if I can. The, the Orange Order. I guess for a lot of people in the UK, they, they just see what they perceive as a kind of marching season, which seems to cause problems at the time. Um, could, could you explain what the Orange Order is and why you believe that it's important that uh, you should be a part of it and should encourage it? Well, if you look at the history of Ireland um, and the history of the British Isles as a whole, um, there were many periods in the past where people faced persecution because of their religious faith. And here in Ireland, um, there was a period when uh, to be Presbyterian or um, Roman Catholic meant to be persecuted um, by the established church. Uh, and then we had the Glorious Revolution uh, when King William III um, came um, and um, uh, was um, uh, enthroned um, on the uh, uh, throne of the United Kingdom. Um, and he came to Ireland. But he came to Ireland to bring liberty, civil and religious liberty. And he established a Bill of Rights. He uh, changed our constitution in a way that gave us the religious liberty that we enjoy today. And I think that's something worth celebrating, something worth remembering, that um, it wasn't just for Protestants. Remember the Pope at the time of William's victory at the Battle of the Boyne um, uh, arranged for bells to be rang in Roman Catholic churches across Europe to celebrate his victory. Why? Because the, the Pope knew that this would bring an end to religious persecution in Ireland, not just for um, Presbyterians like myself, but also for Roman Catholics. So I think this is something worth celebrating, and it saddens me that there are some who try to portray the celebration of the glorious revolution, of the victory of William, that is commemorated through the Orange Order as somehow about sectarianism, because actually the freedoms that William won at the Boyne were freedoms to be enjoyed by people of all religions. But, but it seems to today to have become a sectarian, is that right? Well, that is the perception, yes, and unfortunately because of an ignorance of history, because people don't properly understand what this is about, then they see it 
in Ireland as them and us, as one side against the other. In fact, William's victory at the Boyne in 1690 wasn't a victory for Protestants alone. It was a victory for all of us in that it brought civil and religious liberty um, to this island. Um, and I just wish that that is something that could be celebrated by a, a wider group and that it would be less divisive than it is. And I think part of the problem we have here is uh, that people don't fully understand the history that we have. So you joined the, the, the Orange Order, you joined the Unionist Party, and you worked for a time for, um, for uh, Enoch Powell MP. That must have been an interesting time. Well, indeed it, it was, and on the day that, sadly, Lady Thatcher has died, um, you know, I think of that era of people like Enoch Powell, Margaret Thatcher, great parliamentarians. Um, and I look at the House of Commons today, and we really do miss those kind of um, people, the influence that they brought. Uh, Enoch Powell, I think, was someone who was, again, uh, misportrayed by some people. He had a very strong Christian faith. Um, he was not a racist, as some have suggested. He, he simply saw that there were going to be problems if, if we didn't place limitations on the immigration uh, policy at that time, that there would be real social and economic issues, and indeed, uh, over the years he has proven to be right and we saw the riots, the social unrest that occurred and so on. Now, um, uh, I think that if people revisit some of the things he said, there might be a better understanding. But I remember visiting him in London in, in, in the, um, a short time before he passed away and at that time he was um, doing um, his, his what proved to be his final book which was um, uh, translating the original uh, version of the Gospel of John from it, the original Greek um, and, and, and doing a commentary on it. So he was very heavily influenced by his Christian faith and he was a very interesting man to work for. I had three years of a political apprenticeship with Enoch Powell. I learned a lot about Parliament and parliamentary procedures and how to effectively represent a constituency in those three years. That's right, and you've referred to his River of Blood speech um, too, and the, the influence of that, and, and presumably from what you've just said, you feel that a lot of what he said was right. Well, and I think a lot of what he said was misrepresented, um, which is sad, and it, it is often the case. Um, but then we're reminded of the story of Jesus, and um, you know when he went to um, preach in, in his own uh, homeland, and uh, um, you know he didn't receive quite the best reception um, and his message was not well received by some um, and uh, it prompted the old saying that sometimes a prophet is not always well received in his own land and um, I think that um, maybe Enoch Powell was ahead of his time in, in what he foresaw as some of the social and economic problems that we would face uh, not just in relation to immigration but also of course in relation to Europe as well. So we, we come fast forward to the Good Friday Agreement. When it began, you were part of the Ulster Unionist Party, um, but you changed then to the Democratic uh, Union Party. What, what brought about the change? Well, I'd been a, a member of the Ulster Unionist Party from the age of 18 when I joined the Young Unionist Movement. and. Um, I was elected in 1997 to Parliament as an Ulster Unionist MP um, and I was part of the negotiating team, um, indeed had been from 1990 right through to the um, Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Uh, and I think that was the beginning of the parting of the ways. There were key elements of the agreement that I felt were flawed and, um, uh, 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 and I, I really felt that the Ulster Unionist Party had been pressured into signing the agreement prematurely without these key issues being properly resolved. And it took us almost 10 years from the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 to the restoration of devolution in 2007 to put right the flaws in the agreement. Um, but there was a, a deep division within the Ulster Unionist Party over the implementation of the agreement. Um, and in time, um, it just was not sustainable for the party to hold together, so the party split in uh, 2000, the end of 2003 and lost a substantial number of members, uh, myself included, um, who just felt that the party was not listening to the concerns of ordinary people about the implementation of the agreement and were, they were losing, rapidly losing support. And now today, you know, we're, when I was first elected to uh, Parliament in 1997, not that long ago, 
The UUP had 10 MPs out of um, 18 from Northern Ireland. Today they have none. So um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, um, the Ulster Unionist Party left me more than my, me leaving the Ulster Unionist Party. They left a lot of people um, in not heeding the concerns that people had about how the agreement was being implemented. I think if we, if, if we could talk to our viewers today and, and ask them about something that they struggle with, it would be the area of forgiveness. Um, so often things happen in our life and we just find we cannot forgive. There have been terrible troubles here in Northern Ireland and you've referred to what really prompted you as a young child. How, how have you managed to get to that point of being able to forgive each other? Well, it's very difficult, and I would say um, very clearly, Gordon, it's a personal thing. You, you cannot legislate for forgiveness. You can't impose it on another person. We all have to reach that point ourselves. Um, and for me, it's been an interesting and a very difficult and challenging and sometimes a very painful journey. I remember in 1997 when Sinn Féin entered the negotiations for the first time and sat across the table from... Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and the Sinn Féin leadership. I'd never personally met them prior to that point. I sparred with them on television but never actually sat down with them. Um, and here we were, I was looking at people who were the leaders of an organisation that, you know, had supported or maybe in some cases been responsible for the murder of people, you know, family members, comrades that I'd served with, neighbours and people that I represented in my constituency. Uh, I, indeed, um, not long after I was elected an MP, um, a police officer whose family I'd known in Lisburn, in my constituency, was, was brutally murdered by the IRA um, in a place called Lurgan. And, and the first funeral I attended as an MP was his funeral in Lisburn. So I, here I was, I was sitting across just, you know, literally weeks after that murder. Um, the table, across the table from people who I knew had supported that kind of activity. But over the years, um, it's, you know, with all the changes that there have been, I have found personally that, um, you know, if we harbour bitterness uh, and unforgiveness, um, you know, we do more harm to ourselves than we do to others. And I've seen so many lives damaged by um, you know, holding on to things that God says there comes a moment when maybe we have to not forget what has happened, but let go, hand it over to him. Um, and there are many hymns and verses in the Bible which talk about um, casting our burdens on Jesus, on handing over our burdens to him. And it's really made, I would say it's made the difference for me being a Christian, that I've been able to hand over those burdens to God. Um, and to let go and, 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 and to have them taken from me by God, willingly um, taken from me. Um, the old hymn, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. And for me, um, the death of Jesus on that cross, the forgiveness that I have had from God through his amazing grace um, enables me um, to be unburdened of the spirit of unforgiveness. Um, and it ha is transformational. Um, when that burden is lifted from you, it is like being on the top of Everest and you've had the weight of the world lifted off your shoulders. Mm. I'm sure for many people in Northern Ireland it's, it's a real struggle. Uh, but as you say, it's, it's often for our own good as much as anything that we need to learn to forgive. Well, God doesn't uh, say things for our benefit that are intended to harm us. Um, but I recognise uh, for each individual this is a struggle and it, they have to reach that point in their lives themselves where they can feel that they're able to hand this over to God. Um, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Um, it is not ours to exact revenge on those who have wronged us. Um, it is for God to do that. And I think if we come to that point and we're able to hand that over to him, um, it can be liberating. It does not mean that we forget those we have lost. Far from it. It enables us to focus on, that, on their memory. Uh, on the sense of loss, to deal with our grief, to deal with that sense of loss, um, but without the added burden of the bitterness that unforgiveness brings uh, to us. Um, it does not mean that we abandon justice, because in the end, God will ensure that justice is done. Um, and as Christians, we have that to hold on to. Geoffrey, we're in the last couple of minutes of a programme. If I said to you, 
What should Christians be praying for you as an MP, for your work here in Northern Ireland, indeed for Northern Ireland in general? What would you say? Well, I have the privilege of chairing something called Prayer for Parliament um, um, in, uh, par in the, the UK Parliament, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And every um, week we have intercessory prayer leaders praying for what is happening in Parliament. You see, I believe prayer makes a difference. Um, I remember once uh, someone, before I became a Christian, um, giving me a little scrap of paper with the uh, word Second Chronicles 7.14 written on it and telling me that was the real solution to the problem in Northern Ireland. And of course, that little verse tells us that if um, those who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Today in the 21st century, who is God speaking to when he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. I believe he's speaking to the Christians. In the Old Testament, um, of course, it was in the days of Solomon, it was the children of Israel. But in the New Testament era that we live in, it is um, those who take the name of Jesus. And he's calling us uh, to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. So what can Christians do? Yes, above all else, pray. Pray for righteousness. Pray that um, um, our government will recognize that some of the laws they propose, some of the things they want to do, well-intentioned as they may be, actually um, damage our society. Things like uh, the redefinition of marriage. Here in Northern Ireland, thankfully, we won't have that, um, nor do we have the 1967 Abortion Act. Not because we don't care for women who find themselves with a pregnancy they hadn't expected. Not because we don't uh, recognize that there are people who struggle with their um, sexual orientation. As Christians, we need to reach out to those people. But it does not mean that we have laws that are contrary um, to what we believe is right for our society. There is a balance to be struck. And I ask my fellow Christians, please pray for those of us who've been called to serve God in the world of politics, that we will find the right balances, that we will st strike the right note, that we will stand as a witness to Jesus. But that's not just about standing upon the word of God. It's also about reaching out to those in our society who are in need um, and who perhaps think differently from what we do. Jeffrey, thank you so much for giving of your time today and we do want to pray for you. And I want to say thank you to you for being with us. And my guest today has been the Right Honourable Jeffrey Donaldson. Thank you.